I'm, it, I'm, I'm, like, I'm just really like peanuts right now. So oh, yes! Just, yes! Like, it's like, I think I may be anticipating it more than Star Wars. And I'm really looking forward to Star Wars, but peanuts just looks like, like, perfect. You know, treating it with respect, I, still updating it. And I've been watching, because I'm going to be doing a whole month dedicated to peanuts. So I watched Boy Named Charlie Brown the other day, which is still really good. And, oh, yeah. you know, I've been watching a couple of the, the holiday specials. And it's, yeah. it's I, I like that they're doing it right. But I kind of thought, watching, because it's been a while since I watched, you know, Charlie Brown Christmas, and I thought it was kind of funny. I noticed the animation in that first special, very South park <laughs> I never I realized. It. Oh, God, yeah. why? <laughs> why yeah, is very... it really touch die? <laughs> Yeah, it's very, like, at least with every Charles Schultz movie, like, every of those specials, it's very, very simplified in a way. Like, especially with the first one, but at least, like, it did gradually advance moving on. Like, um, I'm actually really happy that uh, in my P.O. box, I actually did get Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown, and I remember watching that. That was awesome. Surprisingly, Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown? Yeah. Was that the one where they go to the camp and they have that rival that's all like, we're number yeah, one, yeah, yeah. we're number exactly. one, and they do the canoe race? Yeah, exactly, that one. That was good. Yeah. Mike and I recently watched uh, It's the Flash Beagle, Charlie Brown. <laughs> I was waiting for that to pop up. Flash, Flash, Flash Beagle. Beagle. When he jumps high, he shoots like a shining star. <laughs> yeah. Man, I love that so much. I, there, I think there was one episode of the Charlie Brown's TV show where they made like a slight reference to that, where Charlie Brown is lamenting about his dog and brings up Flash Beagle. So then Snoopy somehow learns about Alice in Wonderland, and he does that trick with the kid, Cheshire Cat where if he grins, he disappears. And he does, and he's like, uh, I, no, no, I, no, no, it was Linus who started the whole thing. And Linus like, Charlie Brown, I have a problem. He's grinning, but he can't turn back. So they go to Lucy, and what Lucy does is the most funniest, simplistic thing of all. She slaps Snoopy on the back, and he returns to normal. <laughs> okay, that'll be a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars? What do you expect me for, a TV repairman? <laughs> I, I watched Snoopy come home as well the other oh, day, oh, oh, oh. and I forgot how, like, <laughs> there's like a scene where Snoopy just beats up Linus, and then the following scene he starts beating up Lucy. And it's like, what was up with that? <laughs> that like that movie was kind of weird to me because there's a lot of like weird tangents it goes on. No dogs allowed. <laughs> but you know, I mean, boy, boy named Charlie Brown. A couple of tangents, like there's a whole scene that's just Schroeder playing the piano. Nothing to do with anything else. But you know, but Snoopy Come Home has a lot of those scenes. But the songs are great because it's the Sherman Brothers. Oh yeah, changes. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't that like one of the more like one of the more sadder Charlie Brown specials or movies? Movies. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little sad, but then the end is the end is kind of odd because you know he decides to move with you know move back with his old owner, and then and he then, builds everybody with the messages. <laughs> But, like, at the end, like, when he gets to her apartment and, like, he sees the no dogs all outside and then he's all happy all of a sudden. And, and it's like, well, you were pretty gung-ho before about moving there. And now, you know, it just it was a little odd to me. But, it, you know, Snoopy, I think, can get away with that kind of humor. There's, there's only one special, I think, where they went that direction, but I think it works better there. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's where they reveal how, where Snoopy came from, which was the Sunny Hill farm. Why the fuck am I going there? Um, sorry, that was my. Uh, that was my microphone. Damn it, James! <laughs> Damn it, man, it's my rocking. running gag! <laughs> I'll, I'll reveal the origin of that one later, but no, what happened was the reveal of the origin where Snoopy came from along with his brothers. From the Sunnyville puppy farm, they tried to do a family reunion, and it's actually a little touching in concept, and it sort of works up until the end. They get together, and they're like, okay, we're gonna go find the original farm and stuff, 
And if I remember correctly, they go to this vacant lot where the address is, and they look around and they realize, oh my goodness, it's not a farm anymore, it's a huge parking lot. They literally bulldozed it and turned it into a double-decker city parking lot. And it's like really sad and tragic. And, you know, they realize, oh, you know, it's kind of nice that we finally got Snoopy's brothers together, which is sort of nice. And then it weirds in the... And it ends in the weirdest way. Hmm. Where, like, Snoopy is sending all his cousins um, and brothers home, and he's dressed up as the Red Baron, and then Charlie Brown is sitting in his uh, in a sofa, and he hears, like, a lot of rattling and airplane noises, and he's going on, like, what the hell is that? And then when the noise is you know, and he runs out, looks out the window, and you see Snoopy just having a toothpick in his mouth, like he finished his job. I was really confused by the image as a kid. I always thought he ate his brothers. I was and I don't. What, what and the I heck don't, was that? Did, did he like eat them or something? What was and, that? and I don't understand. In the Halloween special and in Great Pumpkin, why do the adult? Why do the adults hate Charlie Brown so much? And why do they just have rocks? Lying around like ah, oh, <laughs> like, <"What?" laughs> I really, I, I have two funny stories. I brought this up in the list once. When kids saw that, immediately studios were flooded with bags of candy that said for Charlie Brown. <laughs> and a friend of mine, Ed Witch's Woods, did the best joke ever. <laughs> and I'm not kidding here. I have to pinch myself. Otherwise, I can't tell it. There we go. He, um, his dad gave out candy to kids, but whoever was wearing a ghost sheet gave out rocks. And one of the parents actually came back to him and said, Hey, did you give my kid a rock? Because his kid was, you know, dressed in a ghost costume. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I did. And then the dad just looked at the rock and he's like, Dude, that's a funny joke. <laughs> he's like, oh, a fight's going to happen? Oh, wait, he likes it. There you go. Mm-hmm. It could have been worse. In the universe of Family Guy, imagine what it would be like if they went to Herbert's house. Hey, I got a Snickers bar. I got a patch of gum. I got a popsicle. <laughs> no, you, you made me ruin the job. Damn it. Sorry. <laughs> no. I got a Snickers bar. I got a Kit Kat. I got a patch of gum. I got a cock. You might have tried to pick me up like that. <laughs> oh my, I'm scared sheetless. Okay, so folks who are listening out there, here's, um, here's a little something I dug up recently in my room when I was uh, busted things open here, but as you can see, everything's back to normal. My walls are insulated and everything, but I boxed this thing up and uh, pulled it out again just for you guys. This is Mad Magazine, issue number 432, August 2003. And the reason why I bring this up is because it has one of my all-time favorite articles in here. The 50 Worst Things We Hate About the Movies. So... Starting with number one, and yes, this thing has loads of pictures in it, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be holding those up here. Uh, number one, Hollywood's embarrassingly tired theory that the whiter, older, and more feeble someone is, the funnier it is to see them acting like a young black rapper. And for this, they have a picture of uh, Steve Martin and bringing oh, down yeah. the bringing yeah. down the house. I, I, of I would see that. Yeah. Isn't that still going on? Like, no, isn't don't didn't we have that movie with uh, Will Ferrell and Kevin Hart? No, no, that is already running for one of the worst comedies of the year. It's just one big prison rape joke. Yeah, that's what. It, yeah, that's what it, I thought. It, it, like, it was, that's it was still horrible. going on. Oh, I didn't. I didn't oh. see that one. You're, you're I did, lucky, Stuffy. I did Stuffy. Yeah. Hmm? You were so, so lucky. You skipped that one. Uh, I did. I did watch uh, yesterday because I put on Netflix, and I was, I was curious about it. Uh, the Smosh movie, and mm. I absolutely hated it. Like, I mean, they're okay in small doses, those two, but like, it just a full-length movie. It felt really stretched out. That thing. 
Mm -hmm. Like it's, a stretched out YouTube video in a sense? Yeah, basically. Oh, it's a sketch comedy film, what do you expect? I mean, well, I like the Cinema Snob movie, but that, you know, had a... That's, that felt like it was trying to say something. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. This was just, you know, stupid joke after stupid... And it's like... And it just... It was really straight Like, they... Because about 45 minutes in, it felt like they'd finished the story, but then they padded it out some more. Right? And it's just repetitive and not funny. And, and there was one joke I actually did laugh where... I, I, it seems like your kind of joke, Morgan, is because they, um, one of them, because they keep popping up in like YouTube videos of random things, and then he ends up in some furry party, and like he gets like a like some fox ears put on his head, and then like he ends up in like the closet of of a girl he likes who's vlogging, and then he exits, but he leaves the, the fox ears behind. And, like, there's a part where he tries to pretend he's not there. He pretends to be her uncle's ghost or something. And then she opens the closet and finds the ears there. And she's like, Uncle Herbert was a furry? Like, that I thought was funny. But the rest of it, I was just stoned. Let's see if that goes on the wheel of Morgan's taboo offensive things. The joke was... Humorous. <laughs> Although I, I was just don't face like really like it just you know yeah. it didn't note to self I think you might like Amazon Women on the Moon we hear it's, you. A great, it, it's a great parody of blockbuster video that number two one, it's, was, was that where the um that clip in your last like favorite movies yes the pirates is that where yes. that was the the video pirates okay I hadn't, I haven't seen that movie. I, I didn't recognize that. Okay. Number two. James Bond's gradual evolution from a beloved spy series to a two-hour product placement packed sharper image commercial. And they've got all the they got all the plugs here to prove it. Does that still apply with the Daniel Craig movies? Yeah. Well, I don't it think so Sony. as much. Oh, I mean, it is Sony. Almost all Sony movies and Sony products. Penny, darling, would you like a Pepsi on the rocks? <laughs> Money, Penny. Ugh. I actually heard anyway. that apparently the James Bond movies will no longer be associated with Sony. I, I don't know. That's what I heard. But. Well, it's like because I like I think um, the contract MGM is running out, so the other studios courting it. But I feel like Sony will fight to keep it because the last one was a huge hit, and the new one will probably. Be yeah, and like knowing them, like they really are kind of a bit desperate for money, so they do yeah. need number. Get, they need a oh. franchise. Oh. Number three, knowing that Keanu Reeves pulls down something like twenty million dollars per film, while your kid brother, who has a non-speaking role as a tree in a first-grade production of The Seasons, is a significantly more accomplished thespian and does the job for free. Oh. <laughs> Oh no no! That reminds me of a really weird controversy. <laughs> a reason what not, not what a... Go ahead. What do they say? I hear they're down traveling lesbians. Peter <laughs> Reeves is not a, a totally bad actor. He's done some good solid hits here and there. Uh, recently, it was uh, John Wick. Man, oh, that was that mm -hmm. was a, that was a good film. Oh yeah, he yeah, he actually drew emotion for that. Oh, oh yeah. Well, well, we talked. We had a whole episode on Keanu Reeves. Yes, we so have. Ooh, you can check that out. Completely sucks. Or that that reminds me. There's one movie we completely forgot that was good and had Matthew Broderick performing a good performance. Hmm. Matthew Cold Broderick Ray. has performed plenty of good performances. My good sir. Oh, let me, you <laughs> you brought on the fanboy here. <laughs> oh snap! I, let me let me let me explain. I don't think he's a bad actor. I just think he has a bizarre positive attitude and his performance is too much. Regardless, we forgot Glory. Mm. Oh well, yeah. Funny oh. enough, that's the, one of the few performances of his I'm not wild about. I think he's a little miscast in that one. 
<laughs> but okay. that movie is great, though. Fit, I, I do way. think Glory is a great movie, though. Hmm. Number four. That pain in the ass, minimum wage, teenage multiplex employee who actually gives a damn if you sneak into another film after the one you've paid to see is over. What? So, they have a guy, a picture of a guy sneaking into another movie, and this kid kicks him out. It's for the double dippers. Does that even happen anymore, and who does that anymore? James, you do it? I've done it, well... LT talked me into it. Uh, okay. So the bedded there, there, on you. Supposedly there's an urban legend that kids went to see Wild Wild West just for the South Park preview attached to it. Mm. Mm. No, wait, no, no, I screwed that up. They paid to see Wild Wild West and said they went to South Park very long run cut. There you go. Oh, no, so no, that, no. Oh, like, that always that, happens. Thing that people, I'm sure, like, even I actually still do it. For example, this Friday... Uh, t a couple of days ago, I paid my tickets to see Maze Runner, yet I have all the material I need to make a Hotel Transylvania 2 review. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember you did the same thing. Was it you You paid to see Rush and sneaked into Cloudy 2? Yes. I also, actually, <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, Rush was my favorite movie of that year, so few complaints from me. Yeah. Uh, actually, the funny thing is that the worst case scenario I've ever been was for, I believe... It was for Escape from Planet Earth, and there was no other good movie that, like, I want to give my, my money elsewhere. I think I ended up giving it to Hansel and Gretel. Aww. That's yeah, not yeah, so bad, really. actually. Yeah, yeah, we'll see Pitch Perfect 2. I guess we'll sneak in Fury Road. <laughs> what, what about... Okay. Did you pay for Legend of Oz, or... Or no. I'm, no, 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 because I, I go to a Cineplex. I think I used a free ticket for that one. I, I think. Well, there's, like a, there's a funny story, Oz. Legend of Oz, because when I saw them, because I saw the movie like Saturday, you know, preview, like set, you know, those free sneak previews. And usually when I go to see family movies on like Saturday morning screen, they're usually pretty packed. Like they usually pretty, they, they manage to get everyone. Legend of Oz. They put it, I saw it the same theater that I saw Lego Movie, but they put it, Lego Movie they put in the biggest auditorium, they put like Legend of Oz in an auditorium half the size, and there were like ha half people, they were only like, they could only fill half of it. Like Yo. that's how few people went <laughs> in Legend of Oz, even for free and before its release. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I think I remember there were only a few instances I actually saw a movie by myself. I think there was Alpha and Omega, Arthur Christmas, and Penguins of Madagascar, which does explain about its failure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number five. Bigger budgets, enormous advances in special effects, and almost 20 years to work on the screenplays... Yet, still, the new Star Wars movies just suck compared to the first three. And there's our picture. No longer the new Star Wars movies, mind you. We have a new set coming up. Yeah, and even, soon, the, even episode so. three wasn't that bad. Yeah, I mean... I, we, well, we've had this discussion before, too, have we not? We yeah. <laughs> if you want to see our debate of Star Wars versus Star Trek, I'll leave a link in the description below. <laughs> okay, and here's one for you, Morgan. Number six. Writer, director, almost actor, Kevin Smith's Silent Bob vanity character and his tired plot-solving device of dispensing words of wisdom during the film's ten final minutes. Once, Smith finally runs out of genitalia jokes and frantically realizes he needs to tie up all the loose ends. And they have this little picture of uh, Kevin Smith doing some sort of philosophical rant here. Damn. <laughs> that, that, that's possibly the most Kevin, uh, Kevin Smith hate I have ever seen. Yikes. Well, Ooh, uh, yeah. Unless you ask Tim Burton. Mm. And yet Wes Craven got Jay and Son Bob to a cameo in Scream 3. What the hell was up with that? We still have yet to see that, Mike. Yeah, we still need to get to see that. Weird scene. Number seven. <laughs> Number seven, before a movie starts, having to put up with a seemingly endless 
string of lousy songs you've never heard of sound off soundtracks from films you have no interest in seeing while the screen bombards you with ads for local stores and obscenely overpriced milk duds plus movie trivia a two-year-old could answer all being assigned with a presumptuous oh, title of pre-show entertainment that's my favorite i come to the theater early to do I like that I, okay you know what i like that stuff okay yeah. i do you. i come to the theater early just to do that i don't like come right on time when the movie starts i just sit there I'm... I'm a little iffy on that one because currently, well, no, no, we live in a new age now where it's all digital and stuff, and they show like digital behind the scenes commercials or something. I think it's called like Limelight or something, but yeah, in the 90s, they would just have like projector images and like random radio songs, most of them were pop songs, so I'm a little iffy on that one. Cineplexes um, nowadays, they're actually doing it interactively. Like now they're doing like little games with your yep. iPhone. Yep, yes. your phone. Yes. You end up with a high score and you end up getting yep. like little points. And, and, and what's up with so the name? So this is already and, dated then. And, and what's up with the name for all these projection companies? <clears throat> and I'm not kidding here. Cinedime, a new paradigm in cinema. That's the most common It's like one, a pair yeah. of dimes, you know? Number eight. Director Martin Scorsese and his two pet caterpillars he calls eyebrows. What? What? <laughs> what? That's the most random one. What does that have to do with movies? Yeah. Uh, his movies are great. Why, why, why are you picking his, his eyebrows? I like Shutter Island. Come on. Yeah. Hugo was amazing. H Hugo was... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Where's here's the that? one. Hmm? That, that, that movie didn't deserve to bomb in the box office. Exactly, domestically. Dom domestically, correct. Domestically, it didn't do well. Number nine. Big screen versions of lame old sitcoms, the main draw of which is to provide us with two-hour versions of shows we couldn't sit through a single 22-minute episode of. Oh, yeah. And the thrill of seeing how, with a multi-million dollar budget, the set decorator was able to recreate, say, the Brady Bunch's living room. Uh, okay, and here they have the little stockpile of scripts and whatnot. Sitcoms. But, but, but the Flintstones was awesome. Yeah, I, I like that. You know, I, I, I even have the Blu-ray. It looks good. Yeah, Should but they're listing I... off. Oh, oh, they're listing off the Adams Family, really? Adams. No. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. Oh God, no, no. Oh no! No! Oh no! 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 James, no! James, you, you, do not do that. Don't you do not do that! You do not do that! Okay, okay, okay. It's the, it recovers itself here. It says other, ti other titles: Mikhail's Navy, The Beverly Hillbillies, My Favorite Martian. Uh -oh. Really? Yeah. The special effects were cool, but that's about all we got. I I hated it. Car 54, is, where are you? What the heck is there that? Is, oh, 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 that was a sitcom that Al Lewis and Fred Gwynn used to do, a.k.a. Um, Herman Munster and Grandpa Fred. They did it before the Munsters. It was about police that people. That was a TV and, show? Yeah. Yeah. That was a mm. movie based off of a TV show? Yep. Yeah, and they made it in the 80s. I think Buster Poindexter is in it, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Uh, I can totally... And number 10... For, uh, this might be a good stopping point for now. We'll pick up on this later, I think. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Because we, yeah. yeah. we got enough to, yeah. good idea. Uh, to talk about for yeah. a preview. Number 10, that one-trick pony Sandra Bullock has managed to carve out a hugely successful career playing the same slightly nerdy working-class woman who suddenly becomes irresistibly sexy the moment she pulls off her glasses. And here's that miscongeniality take we're talking about. Yeah, it doesn't quite apply to gravity. No. Uh, no. No. A bit. Okay, not gonna lie, a bit. Because, like, it is still that nerdy... T like, it has a bit of the trope that Sandra Bullock would often play. You know, like, the mm -hmm. kind of woman who, who's taken more seriously with her job and, like, you know, the kind, the kind that's more, like... The working class, the working class woman. That's the best way to put it. Mm hmm You think that's bad? Try hot pursuit. That is a drinking game of Sandra Bullock cliches without her. 
<laughs> the, oh wow! Yeah, the worst, the worst Sandra Bullock movie I've seen is all about Steve. Isn't the best thing out of it was an it was like this interview about Hot Pursuit, and then suddenly Gilbert Godfrey came out of nowhere. It was no, no. What, what was it that, or was it the Heat? No. Oh, okay. No, I'm sorry. That was the Heat because it it also had Melissa McCarthy. Yes. yes. It's amazing. She never stops being sexy, though. Yep. That's the great thing about Sandra Bullock. Yep. Okay. Anyway. That was 10 of 50. We'll probably do this as a five-part series. Yeah. If, if you guys like this, uh, let us know. Let us know in the comments below. Oh, what is that <laughs> you got there? <gasps> what is that, Morgie? Morgie, Morgie? It's a special yeah. reprint of all Mad Magazine movie parodies, including, and I quote, uh, Ghostbusters is Ghostbusters, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid is Botch Casually and the Sum Dunce Kid, Clockwork Orange is Clockwork Lemon. What? Ha! Post, <laughs> ha! Uh, the Graduate is the Postgraduate, uh, Scarface is Scared Face, Exorcist is Eek or Cyst, Raging Bull, Rabbing Bully, Reese, Cease, Home Alone, Home Agrown, Raiders of a Lost Ark, Raiders of a Lost Art, Brokeback Mountain is, oh god, Bear Bud Mountain, 300 is Boo, and probably my favorite parody is the Siskel and Ebert Review, and Miss Doubtful. Mm. Which contains the alternate ending where he gets together with, good god, Pierce Brosnan's character. Oh, wow. What a twist. What a twist.